You know, last night we were having problems with this microphone. I hope we have this debugged. Eh, it kept going up and down, and the sound was going in and out, and I'm having all kinds of problems with this thing, but I hope we've got it debugged right now. So, in order to debug your spiritual life, let's uh, begin with silent prayer by utilization of 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, that gives us the privacy to go to God and name our sins to Him. Therefore, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study this portion of the Word of God today. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that this portion of the Word may become a blessing and a challenge to us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now last night we left off by examining fear, worry, and anxiety. We were studying the Exodus generation and how much impact fear had on their lives. And we also contrasted Moses with the two million others in the Exodus generation. And we pointed out that Moses had an absolute confidence in God, which resulted in courage toward people. So tonight we'll begin our, we'll, uh, begin our study by you turning to Exodus 14.11. Exodus 14:11. Now yesterday we breezed through the sin of fear, but tonight we're going to dig a little deeper into the subject of fear, and we're also going to touch on the other mental attitude sins, which include bitterness, maligning, gossip, slander, and vindictiveness. And uh, as we get to the close of this message, I hope to touch on some points of grace, but if we don't get to that tonight, then we'll do that tomorrow night. All right, you should have found your place by now, Exodus 14:11. So let's begin reading here. Now this is the children of Israel speaking to Moses. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now not only were the children of Israel in a state of fear, but as you can see from this verse, they are also harboring feelings of bitterness toward Moses. And you can almost hear the venom in their souls as they speak these words to Moses. They say, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Now you see, it, just, it wasn't just one person who came up to Moses and started complaining to him and harassing him and blaming him for their problems. So with this in, in mind, let's take down this doctrine. It is the doctrine of the sin bandwagon. So you might want to entitle this portion of our study as The Doctrine of the Sin Bandwagon. Now when the Israelites were trapped against the Red Sea, they probably had a few men who were walking around and they were keeping watch. They were looking out over the desert. And there was probably one man who looked out over the desert and he saw these billowing clouds of dust on the horizon moving in closer. So what, what would somebody like that do? Now, he probably started to shout, Look, it's the Egyptian chariot forces. What are we going to do? So the others probably, they probably heard the fear in his voice. So they started to jump on their fear bandwagon. So eventually, all two million Jews were shouting out of fear. And they were crying out to God. Now, you see, fear spreads. So take down a point under the heading, The Doctrine of the Sin Bandwagon. Point one. Mental attitude sins have the potential of spreading like a horrendous wildfire. Point one, mental attitude sins have the potential of spreading like a horrendous wildfire. Now, when I was younger, I went to upstate New York. I was visi visiting my cousin, and there were about eight of us. And it was dark. It was dark outside. The sun, is, the sun had just set, and we were... We, decided to go to this house. It was an abandoned house. It was very large, almost like a mansion. It was an older house, probably built before World War II, and it was abandoned. So we all decided to go in this house, and it was, it was pitch black in there. And as we walked into the house, it had these hardwood floors, and as we would take a step, the floors would creak, and they would squeak, and it sounded, it sounded so spooky as we were moving through there. And then all of a sudden, the girl in front of me, 
she accidentally brushed against a mop. Now the mop was standing upright, so it seemed like there were dreadlocks hanging off this hanging off this mop, but it was actually just the strands of the mop hanging there. So she brushed against this mop with her arm, and she let out the most horrendous scream. It would make the hair on the back of your neck just stand straight up. She let out, now what happened? Now when she let out this scream, the guy behind me, he started to scream, and he tried, was trying to run out of there, and he was crawling all over me, trying to crawl over the top of me, and he was grabbing onto me and trying to push me out of the way, and he was screaming. So what did this do? This got me a little shook up, so I wanted to... Well, actually, I did. I started screaming, and we were all, all eight of us were just all running out of this house, and we're in a state of fear, and we're screaming. So you see how fast this sin spread, this sin of fear? Do you see how fast it just went from one girl who bumped into the mop, and she let out a screech, and then the friend behind me, he let out a screech, he ran over the top of me, and before you knew it, everybody, the whole place just burst out in fear. Now, the news, the liberal media, they have a good way of understanding the bandwagon. They know the bandwagon theory. You have commercials on TV, and they understand the bandwagon. If you can get somebody to buy a certain kind of Levi jean for 70 bucks, then everybody's going to start jumping on that bandwagon, and then they're going to buy a pair of jeans for 70 bucks, even though you can get just as good a quality as another store for 30 bucks. So everybody starts to jump on this bandwagon. So the people in the news, the news media, they understand this. And I know all of you probably remember watching on the news about the Columbine High School shootings, and there have been several school shootings across the country, and they start to play on people's fears. They start to play on our fears, and in fact, it's been so successful that there are Americans who are actually willing to give up their freedoms. They're actually willing to give up their Second Amendment right. They're actually handing over their guns out of fear. You see, the children of Israel were no different. When the children of Israel were trapped against the Red Sea, and they saw this Egyptian army coming, all of a sudden they were all willing to go back to slavery. They were willing to give up their freedom. They all jumped on this bandwagon, just as Americans are jumping on this gun control bandwagon, and it's all motivated by the sin nature. It's all motivi motivated by fear. And the media plays on this. They want everybody to jump on this bandwagon of fear, of the sin nature. So here we are, the American people, this land of the free. We are allowing our freedoms to be taken away from us because everyone is wanting to jump on this sin bandwagon. Now, not only does fear spread, but other mental attitude sins spread as well. Bitterness can spread like gangrene. You know, in the Middle Ages, they didn't have indoor plumbing. The only thing they had, they didn't even have outhouses. The only thing they had was a chamber pot. And everybody would use the bathroom on this chamber pot. So you can all guess what was in this chamber pot. Now, what would happen was, once this chamber pot got full, they would go to the window and they would toss the contents out onto the street. And if you were out on, to, if you were out on the street, you better watch out because if you don't, all of the stench and all of the stink is going to fly out of the window and it's going to splatter all over you. Now, you know there was a, a system of chivalry back then. The man would have to walk on the inside of the sidewalk or the street. I doubt they had sidewalks back then, just, just a street and then apartments and houses where people would throw this dung out of their window. And the man would have to walk on the inside so that he could shield his date from getting splattered by this dung. That must have been a good time for dating. Yeah, especially for the man, huh? Now, you know... Well, you know what? You fellows, you probably could look on the bright side of this. Because if, if your girlfriend wants to break up with you... If you were living in the Middle Ages and your girlfriend says, eh, you know, it's not going to work out... I, I really want to break it off. And you could say, uh, well, what do you mean you want to break up with me? You know, don't you know how much crap I've gone through just to be with you? Now, that's literal, you know. <laughs> anyway, let's go on with uh, the point here. The point is that bitterness spreads just like the, the stench of a chamber pot when it's thrown out of the window and it splatters all over you. It spreads. And the whole city, when they would throw this stuff out of the window, the whole city would just start to 
stink with this stuff. And that's what bitterness is. It's a stench, and it spreads around from person to person. And another illustration of this would be, now if you're married, you know what I what I mean by this. You know, a wife and a husband, they start to get into this argument. Now what what may happen here? You see what could happen? The husband could come home from his job, and uh, he might be bitter toward his boss because he had a bad day at work. So he comes home, he sits down, and the wife brings him his dinner, and he's eating, and the wife says, uh, Well, how's the dinner, honey? And then he might say something like, Woman, don't you know that I don't like green beans? What did you give me green beans for? And he goes on and on, and he starts shouting and getting all upset with his wife. And so then the wife reacts to the husband, and she becomes bitter. And then they're arguing, and then if the children are in the house, they get affected. Because that's the wife and the husband. They're busy pouring their chamber pots on each other, and then the children can smell it. So as you see, this bitterness, these mental attitude sins, when you start expressing it through the tongue, it starts to spread around, and everybody starts to get affected by this sin nature. They all jump on the bandwagon of the sin nature, and everybody wants to get in on the argument. Everybody wants to be right, and they want to argue, and they want to fight, and everybody just jumps on this fear bandwagon, and this bitter bandwagon, and this old sin nature bandwagon. Now, I know that probably many of you have been to a party, and everybody was having a good time, and then all of a sudden, this joker walks into the room. He might be mad at his girlfriend. His girlfriend wanted to go to this party. He didn't. He would rather be back in the car making out or something, so he's at this party, and he's he's already upset with his girlfriend. He's already bitter toward her, and he's sitting there, and he's just fuming, and he looks out at everybody, and they're having a good time. And because they're having a good time and he's in a state of misery, he just he just fumes all the more. He just hates everybody there, everybody there, even though he doesn't know them. And this one guy, this one guy with these feelings of bitterness, everybody starts to notice him because he sticks out like a sore thumb. And everybody starts to notice this fellow. And then the whole party just seems to be ruined. The whole party has this damper on it. And that's because mental attitude sins have the potential to spread. You know, one time uh, I went on a date with a, a girl, and she seemed like a good prospect. At least I thought she was a good prospect. And after the date, my friend called me, and he asked me how it went. And uh, I told him the truth. I said, well, it didn't go as well as I thought it would. And I left it at that, but he wanted a few more details, so... He said, well, what happened? And I said, well, you know, I really don't want to gossip about it or anything, so uh, let's just leave it at that. But he kept on and on. Come on, man, what happened? Tell me what happened. And so, what? you know what I did? I was an idiot. Do you know what I did? I just let it all hang out. I told him everything. I told him everything that happened. And I bet some of you want to know what happens, but I'm not going to tell you because that would be gossip now, wouldn't it? But anyway... I was just letting it all hang out, and I told him every detail. I told him everything that I thought that she had done wrong. And do you know what happened? Do you know what that was like? It was like throwing a lit cigarette into a pool of gas. Because when I went to work, that friend who I had, I had confided in my friend about what had happened, and all of a sudden he started telling the co-workers there, and they started to hear about it, and so they started to talk about it, and everybody was gossiping about this poor girl. I mean, they were running this poor girl into the ground. I mean, they were doing it worse than I was. I mean, it just spread around. You see, everybody wanted to jump on this sin bandwagon. Basically, I lit this cigarette, and I threw it into a pool of fire. And I started this fire, and I was an idiot for doing that. I mean, I was in a state of severe sin when I did that, and it just spread around, and I watched it happen, and that was that was wrong of me. But don't worry, I, I rebound, and I'm back in fellowship right now. All right, let's take down point two. Point two, even though others may gossip, malign, and judge, do not jump on the bandwagon of sin, no matter how tempting that may be. You know, Moses, he didn't jump on the bandwagon of sin. He didn't cry out in fear. He didn't become bitter toward God when God told him, Hey, Moses, lead these rebellious people out of Egypt. Moses led those rebe rebellious people out of Egypt, and he was stuck there against the Red Sea. And then they were complaining and whining, and they were going to Moses, Why have you done this to? Why have you done this to us? 
Now Moses, he didn't, he didn't all of a sudden become bitter toward God. He didn't say, now God, why did you let this happen to me? Why did you let me lead these two million rebellious idiots out here? Why did you do this? No, Moses didn't do that. Moses wouldn't do that. He was a spiritual giant, and he knew that he had to live his life in the light of eternity, so he didn't do that. So point two again, even though others may gossip, malign, and judge, do not jump on the bandwagon of sin, no matter how tempting that may be. Now let's take down point three. Point three, mental attitude sins are the worst sins. Mental attitude sins are the worst sins. No, a lot of Baptists, a lot of Baptists, they think the worst sins include smoking and drinking and fornication. And you know what? Smoking and drinking, they aren't even issues in the spiritual life. And fornication, it doesn't make it into the top seven sins that are listed in the Word of God. And here's a good one that a lot of churches use, not just the Baptists, I don't want to pick on them. But a lot, of, a lot of churches, you know, you could use this phrase for them, you know, don't drink, smoke, chew, or go with girls who do. But you know what? These people who say these things, these people who go to these churches and they don't understand the doctrine of sin, they don't understand all of the all of the sins that are involved in the sin nature. It's not just fornication, it's not just adultery, it's not just murder. There are there are sins that are worse than those sins. And you know a lot of these people who are ignorant of the word of God, they start to judge others for real or apparent sins. You know what? When they start to judge other people for that, they are involved in the worst sins. Now, what did Jesus say to the scribes, the Pharisees, and the hypocrites? And Jesus said, get the log out of your own eye before trying to remove the speck of dust from your brother's eye. So people in their arrogance, people in their mental attitude sins, they're always wanting to judge someone else. They're always wanting to uh, remove the speck from their brother's eye when they have a log in their eye. I remember one time I was at work and I was puffing on a nice cigar and it was during, we were getting ready to go on break and I was sitting there and this woman came up to me and she said, you know, I was talking about my plans for the future and I figured that I had the communication gift so I was talking about being a missionary or a pastor or something and she said, well, you know what, I don't see how you could be a missionary when you're sitting there smoking that cigar. So you see... She's sitting there judging me for doing something that's not even a sin. It's not even a sin. I was simply relaxing and enjoying myself. So again, you might want to write this down, what Jesus said to the scribes, the Pharisees, and the hypocrites. He said, get the log out of your own eye before trying to remove the speck of dust from your brother's eye. You need to avoid judging other people. Do you know if you judge someone, you receive double discipline? You not only get judged for the sin that they've committed, you get judged double. And how many of you want that? You don't want that. You want to avoid this. And mental attitude sins are the worst sins. And the reason why uh, people come up with these taboos is, well, the problem is that most people in Christendom's day, and most Christians, they don't even know the Word of God. So in order for us not to be guilty of this ignorance, let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16. And we're going to begin at verse 6. Now I'm going to quote it here. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. All right, so you might want to write down these seven worst sins. Number one, haughty eyes. Now that is pride. That is the worst sin. This lead, that led to the fall of Satan. Pride is the worst sin. Number two, a lying tongue. Now this is slander. This is when you want to run somebody else down into the ground. She looks better than she does anyway, and she's wearing a really short skirt, and she's a lot prettier than this other girl, so this girl feels jealous. And what does she do? She turns to the friend that she's walking with through the mall or something, and she points this girl out who's wearing this short skirt, and she says, uh, Hey, you see that girl over there? She's nothing but a slut. 
See, this is slander. And that's number two. It's, it makes it into the top list of sins. Now, number three, a heart that devises wicked plans. That's revenge motivation. Number four, feet that run rapidly to evil. You know, I can't help but thinking of this part of the verse, feet that run rapidly, rapidly to evil. When I turn on television and I see talk shows like Jerry Springer and Jenny Jones and all of these talk shows where people get on these shows and they gossip about each other, they malign each other, they beat each other up, and they're involved in everything that is disgusting. They're involved in everything that the sin nature offers in the way of mental attitude sins, and they're involved in this. And do you know what people do? People turn on their television. They run to this stuff. They run to it. They turn on their televisions. They're wondering what the ne next episode is about. You know, uh, I'm not even going to mention some of the episodes that come on there because they're so ridiculous. And so they sit there and they watch this gossip and they watch this sinning, this maligning, this judging, and they all get a kick out of it, and they laugh about it, and they think it's so wonderful, and it's so funny, and they go to work, and they talk about it. Oh, did you see uh, Jerry Springer, where this guy did this to this girl, and this girl did this to that girl, and all these things happened, and this is feet. They're running rapidly to evil. People are getting a kick out of this iniquity. And number five, we have a liar. And then number six, we have one who spreads strife among believers. Now notice it says spreads. Sin spreads. People want to jump right out of fellowship and they want to jump right onto the sin bandwagon. Sin spreads. Strife spreads among believers. And um, I left one out here and that's murder. And murder, murder is simply a result of the mental attitude sins and it is the only overt sin that makes it into the list of the top seven sins. All the rest deal with thought. Therefore, let's take point four. Point four, you are what you think. If you harbor mental attitude sins, then you... All right, let's take it down again. Point four, you are what you think. I know I'm probably going a little too fast for some of you, so I'll try to slow down a little. And along with point four, if you harbor mental attitude sins, then you are the contents of a chamber pot. And you will be a stench to everyone around you. Point four, you are what you think. If you harbor mental attitude sins, then you are the contents of a chamber pot, and you will be a stench to everyone around you. Now turn in your Bibles to James chapter 3, verse 3. James 3, beginning at verse 3. I'm quoting here, Now if you put bits into the mouths of horses so that now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so they may obey us, we can direct their entire bodies. Now, you know the horse is a large and powerful animal. You know they have more strength in their neck muscles than a man has in his entire body. A horse is very, very powerful. And I know this because I was riding a horse for my first time. I think it was my first time I had ever been on a horse. And I was riding this horse. We were riding it up through the hills. I was with my father and my uncle and my cousin. We were all riding horses. We were riding up through the hills of upstate New York. It's very beautiful up there. We were coming down this hill. And I don't know what I did. I was an inexperienced horse rider, so I probably pulled that bit a little bit too hard and it probably hit that nerve on that horse. And that horse, the next thing I know, I'm sitting there enjoying the ride, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting on the ground. I mean, it just threw me right off, right onto the ground. I didn't even know what hit me. And then I'm, hit, I'm sitting there. It took me a while to get oriented, and I'm thinking, what in the world just happened? But you see, that horse is very powerful. And what James is trying to tell us here is that when you, you can direct a horse simply by putting a bit in its mouth. A horse is much stronger than us, but if you put that bit in a horse's mouth, you can direct it. You can turn it. If you want to go east, you just uh, lay that bridle right over the um, right side of the horse, and then it'll turn to the right, whichever way you want it to go. You can direct the horse, even though it's far more powerful than any man, man can direct the horse. Now let's look at uh, verse 4 of chapter 3. 
Behold, the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are, they are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. You know, it's the same with an airplane. My father, he used to in instruct people on how to fly. He used to have a private pilot, pilot's license. And then he decided to go ahead and... Uh, become an instructor because you can make a little money being an instructor he hasn't done this for many years now but he taught me how to fly and there's one thing that you learn you know the airplane the airplane is pretty big and they have a small rudder just as ships have a small rudder and if an airplane is in strong winds if you're coming downwind and you're going to land you're on your last leg of your approach you're coming in for a landing if you're going south and you're landing, but the wind is blowing from the east and it's hitting you from the side, what you do is you kick in that left rudder, it pivots the plane around, and it allows you to come in for a straight landing. You'll be able to line up with that runway and just move right in and land really smoothly, even though the wind is blowing from the east, trying to push you to the west, you just use that rudder and it directs the plane. And that's what James is saying about this ship here. If you're in a ship, you can direct the rudders and the and the, the ship will go wherever you want it to. And then, after these illustrations that James gives us, he goes on in, ver in verse 5. So also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest it's set aflame by such a small fire. Now the tongue is a very small part of the body. If you were to take your tongue out and place it beside your body, your body would be much, much bigger than that small tongue of yours. But you see, even though the tongue is a small part of the body, it can do more damage than your entire body. You know, I remember when I was very young, I guess I was oh, seven years old, and there was this bully. He would always come over to my house, and he would pick on me, and he would try to beat me up. And I was talking to my parents about it, and I didn't know what to do. And my parents said, well, well, the next time he does this, then just haul off and hit this guy. You know, defend yourself when he does it. And uh, that was the first fight I've ever been in. And then I got into a fight, and I beat, I beat the living tar out of this, this kid. I beat him up, and he started crying, and... Well, it wasn't very nice of me to do all of this, but, I mean, it was it was basically self-defense. He would always come down and bully me, and finally I got tired of it, and I took my dad's advice, and, and I tore into him. And, but do you know what? Even though I beat the crap out of him, and he had these black eyes, and he was looking all ragged after I got through with him, you want to know something? The tongue can do more damage than the entire body. You see, you beat somebody up, that's one person. You beat them up, you, they, you give them a black eye, or and they swell up, or you do something like that. You get involved in violence or something. You know what? The tongue can do more damage, because the sins of the tongue, they can spread like a wildfire. They can spread around, and they can, they can hurt multiple people, and they can hurt friends and loved ones, and... It's horrible because it affects the soul of people. You know, with the, your whole body, you can hurt the physical appearance of someone, but it doesn't necessarily affect their soul. But when you start getting into the sins of the tongue, when you start gossiping and maligning, you can actually hurt the soul of somebody because it spreads around. And it's bitterness. You've just taken your chamber pot, and you've thrown it out the window, and you've splattered it all over everybody, and so the whole place stinks. Way to go. All right, now let's look at James 3, 6. I'm quoting James 3, 6. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members is that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Now let's analyze James 3, 6. The world of iniquity, the world of iniquity in James 3, 6. Now, we have the Greek word cosmos. Now, this is translated world, but it is referring to the cosmic system, that system devised by Satan, which runs counter to God's system. You might want to write this down, the cosmic system. The cosmic system is that system devised by Satan, which runs co counter to God's system. And then after the word cosmos, we have the word adikia. 
Adikia, A-D-I-K-I-A, and that is tr correctly translated, wrongdoing. The world of iniquity, therefore, can be translated, the cosmic system of wrongdoing. Then we have the another part of the verse, and it is translated by the NASB as, and sets on fire the course of our life. Now, the Greek word used for the course of our life is the word genesis, or genesis. It's the Greek word. It's G-E-N-E-S-I-S, -E just like the first uh, book in the Bible. And that actually refers to a course of events. And then we have the phrase, and is set on fire by hell. Now, the word used here for hell is the word Gehenna. And I'll transliterate it for you so you can write it down, G-E-E-N-N-A. And when you have two E's together in the Greek, it just pronounces an E-H, Gehenna. Now, Gehenna, Gehenna originally referred to the Valley of Hinnom. And that was located to the southwest of Jerusalem. And this is where a perpetual fire blazed on its garbage heaps. And this later became a symbol of the eternal abode of unbelievers, which is commonly translated hell. So let's get down to the corrected translation. You might want to write the corrected translation down. And the tongue is a fire, the very cosmic system of wrongdoing. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of events and is fueled by the agency of hell. Now, when you engage in gossip, when you engage in the sins of the tongue, the sins of gossip, maligning, judging, then you have become part of the cosmic system. You have become part of Satan's system. And not only that, you are involved in wrongdoing. And wrongdoing is worse than sin. Wrongdoing is classified as that which is more treacherous and devastating than sin. Now, what does the tongue do? The tongue reveals what you are thinking. If you are thinking in terms of bitterness, jealousy, vindictiveness, implacability, revenge motivation, the tongue will soon reveal your motives because you will say something nasty about somebody else. Now, immediately, you have started a course of devastating events, just as James 3.6 is saying. You will set on fire the course of events. You have started a course of devastating events. And this occurs because others are going to be hurt, and they're going to react to your involvement in Satan's system. And your involvement is wrongdoing. You know what you're going to do when you get involved in this wrongdoing, when you get involved in the sins of the tongue? It's just like throwing that lit, lit cigarette right into the pool of gas, and it's going to blow up, and it's going to spread around, and it's going to hurt everything and everyone in its path. Now, when the children of Israel, they got involved in this satanic system of wrongdoing, they were bitter toward Moses. So what happened to them? Well, Moses... He was a great spiritual giant, and he wasn't affected by those bitter and malicious things that were said about him. He didn't react. You know what he did? He used the fourth stage of the faith rest drill. He put the matter in the hands of the Supreme Court of Heaven. He did not react to the children of Israel. He simply left it in the hands of God. And that's what you need to do. When someone says something bad about you, what do you do? Do you react? Do you want to hurt them? No, you better not do that. We're supposed to put it in the hands of the Lord. Make room for the Lord. Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. That's what you're supposed to do. You leave it in the hands of the Supreme Court of Heaven. It's open 24 hours a day. If someone does something wrong to you, you do not react. You do not jump on the sin bandwagon. You leave it in the hands of the Lord. Now, do you know what the Supreme Court of Heaven did to these people, this degenerate generation of Israel? The Supreme Court of Heaven caused every one of those people in the Exodus generation, with the exception of Caleb and Joshua and Moses, every one of those people, they died. They died to sin unto death in the desert. You know, the flames that they set, the flames that they set with their tongue, the flames that they set with their bitter reaction, the flames that they set, it blew up in their own face. 
They lived out their days in misery, and they died a horrible and miserable death in the middle of a desert. Now this is what God does to those who continuously use their tongue as an instrument of destruction. If you want to gossip about somebody, if you want to judge somebody, go ahead. But I want to tell you something. God does not allow it. You cannot compromise God. God's justice cannot be compromised. God's righteousness cannot be compromised. And if you get into this, this wrongdoing, then I promise you, you will live a miserable life. And you will die the sin unto death if you don't rebound and get cracking with the spiritual life. Now that should wake a lot of you up who are involved in these sins. But if you are involved in these sins, there is a solution. And I'm going to show you this solution. It's in the Bible. You don't have to die the sin unto death. God, in his matchless grace, he has given to every one of us a solution to both sin and wrongdoing. So turn in your Bibles to James 4. James 4, 8. Now I'll read it. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now there is so much idiocy in Christendom today. There is so much utter insanity. A person might commit some horrible sin, some horrible act, so they feel a little guilty. So they go to their pastor, and they forsake the privacy of their priesthood, and they talk to their pastor about their sins, and that's an issue between you and God. You don't need to go to anybody about your sins, but they feel guilty, so they go to their pastor. And they go, and they forsake the, the privileges and the privacy of their priesthood, and that is a mistake. So they go to their pastor and they say, you know, I feel so horrible, I have, quote, fallen away from God. Now what do most pastors out there who don't know the word of God, what do they do? They say, well, brother, what you need to do, you just need to get closer to God. Now I have one thing to say about these pastors who do nothing, they do nothing but utter these meaningless phrases and disgusting epigrams. They're idiots. They don't know the difference between their elbow and their their head. Yeah, I almost said something that wouldn't have been too becoming there. Yeesh. All right, let's analyze uh, James 4 a Drawing near to God is one definite act. It is not a series of actions. It's not, okay, brother, well, you messed up, so what you need to do now, you need to tithe. Or you need to teach Sunday school. Or you need to do this and that and the other thing. And that is not drawing near to God. Drawing near to God is one definite act. It's in the Greek and it says it's one definite act. And it is the utilization of 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins to God, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Now this is how you draw near to God. And then later in the verse it says, And God will draw near to you. Now this is a symbol of fellowship with God. Christian fellowship is not fellowship with people. It's not some Disneyland church. It's not some place where you go to meet a mate. Christian fellowship is rapport with God. Now you mark this down. Christian fellowship is harmonious rapport with God. And that's what it means when it says God will draw near to you. When you rebound, when you name those sins to God, you're purified and God will draw near to you. You'll be restored to fellowship and you will once again have a harmonious rapport with God. Now the verse goes on to say, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Now this is again a reference to 1 John 1, 9. We're all sinners. When it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, it's not talking about the other guy. It's not talking about the person sitting next to you. It's talking to each and every one of us. 1 John 1, 8 says, if any believers, it's talking about believers here. 1 John was written to believers. If any believer says that he is without sin, then he is deceiving himself and the truth is not in him. So this verse that James wrote, he's writing it to all believers. He's writing to every one of us because every one of us have a sin nature. And what he's telling us to do, he's telling us to cleanse our hands through the utilization of 1 John 1, 9. Now, purifying your heart, it's completely different from cleansing your hands. Cleansing your hands is the, is the first thing that you must do, and purifying your heart is completely different. It's different from cleansing your hands. 
purifying your heart. It's cardia in the Greek. But you know what? The only way you can purify your heart is if you at first cleansed your hands. Because when you cleanse your hands with the rebound technique, then you have restored the power of the filling of the Holy Spirit, your mentor, and he teaches you all things. And as you study the word of God under your right pastor, and he should teach accurate Bible doctrine, then this is how you purify your heart. It is through the intake and metabolization of Bible doctrine. Therefore, this verse is emphasizing the importance of Bible doctrine in your life. Bible doctrine should be number one in your life. There's nothing else that should be any more important than Bible doctrine because nothing else matters. Your life is like a vapor vapor trail. James tells that. You know, you look up in the sky and you you see these vapor trails of the jets. They fly away. The vapor trail, trail is there for one moment and then it vanishes. That's what your life is like. One minute you're there, the next minute you're gone. It's that fast. Now, Bible doctrine should be number one in your life because the Word of God, that stuff, this stuff in the Bible that you put into your soul, the Word of God that you're stuffing into your soul, that will live and abide forever. The Bible says the Word of God lives and abides forever. Now, this is eternity. You must start living your life in the light of eternity. And this is why Bible doctrine is so important. Nothing else matters. And if you don't purify your heart, because a lot of garbage gets in there, when you shut off your heart to Bible doctrine, when you start to take on this, listen to the things on TV, and you start watching TV, and you start ignoring Bible doctrine, then the, all of a sudden the cosmic system starts to creep its way into your soul, and you start getting trash into your stream of consciousness. And this is what James is telling you. If you have trash in your stream of consciousness, he's saying, purify your heart through the metabol metabolization and application of Bible doctrine. Then... If you don't do this, if you decide that Bible doctrine is not important in your life, you're going to end up as a Daisukos believer. And a Daisukos believer is a double-minded believer. It's an insane person. Do you know that there are millions of believers in this country, and they are completely insane? Because they have they've refused to follow the mandates of James 4.8. And they're insane. You can turn on television. You can watch these preachers on television. You know they're insane. There's some idiot with a funny haircut on TV. He starts bopping people on the heads. That's ridiculous. That's not the spiritual life. Or that woman on TV, she plasters herself up with makeup. And she looks like a clown. And that's not the issue. There's nothing wrong with makeup. But the issue is they get on television. They shout praise God and hallelujah and all of these little epigrams again. They say all of this stuff and they don't even love God. They don't know the Word of God. The only way you can come to a love for God the Father is through taking in the Word of God. And if you neglect the Word of God, then you're never going to come to a love for God. And that's the advanced stage of the, of the spiritual life. You don't come to a personal love for God until you have lots of doctrine. And you must start out somewhere, so you might as well start now. If you want to have happiness, you might as well start now. Because as a believer, God is not going to tolerate you putting something else above Bible doctrine. Learning Bible doctrine, learning Bible doctrine is a daily process. It's not a one-shot decision. It's not, it's not dedication. You don't dedicate yourself again. It's not dedicating yourself to God and saying, well, I'm going to commit myself to the Lord this Sunday, and then I'm going to do it again next Sunday, and the next Sunday. That's not how you do it. It's not a one-shot de decision. It's a daily process. And you ha and if you have placed anything above learning the Word of God, then you are in a rough ride. You're going to live out your days. You're going to live out your life in misery. And you're going to end up just like the Exodus generation. You're going to end up dying to sin that is face to face with death. And that's given to us in 1 John 5. 1 John 5, it talks about the sin face to face with death, and that's what you'll end up like if you don't get with the spiritual life. You'll be in complete misery. You have a spiritual life in this church age that Moses yearned to see. You have something absolutely phenomenal, and to whom much is given, much is expected. And not only that, if you don't make Bible doctrine number one in your life, then you're going to stand before Jesus Christ, who pioneered this unique spiritual life. Jesus Christ will be standing in front of you in all of his glory, and he's going to ask you. He's going to say, what have you done with this unique spiritual life? And then he's going to ask you, what would you did with those two power options? 
He's going to ask you what you did with those three spiritual skills. He's going to ask you what you did with those four spiritual mechanics and those ten problem-solving devices. And you're going to stand there in shame in your naked resurrection body because you will not receive the eternal rewards. You will not receive the crown of life or the crown of righteousness. You will stand there in shame. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved, approved unto God a work in that need is not to be ashamed. Jesus Christ didn't live 33 years on this earth for nothing. While you go about dealing and worrying about your trivial matters, you keep this in mind. Jesus Christ pioneered this unique spiritual life. He tested and he proved this spiritual life, and this spiritual life works. Jesus Christ went to the cross, and he stayed on the cross. And as each one of our sins was being imputed to him, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus Christ was forsaken for you and me, and it was the power of the whole, the filling of the Holy Spirit. It was the power of the filling of the Holy Spirit. That power that has been given to you, it sustained him on the cross, and Jesus Christ has given to us this same power. So when you put Bible doctrine on the shelf, just think of the day when you're going to be face to face with Jesus Christ in all of his glory at the Bema evaluation after the resurrection of the church. And he's going to ask, what have you done with this spiritual life? And if you have neglected this unique spiritual life, then you're going to be ashamed. You will be a part of the ultimate oxymoron of human history, both human and angelic. Now, you have every right to reject this spiritual life, but if you do, I want to tell you, you're going to face some consequences. You're going to live out the days of your life in complete and utter misery, and you will end up at the evaluation throne in a state of complete and total shame. And there's going to be a memorial set up just for you as a memorial of lost opportunity, and it's going to be set up in your arm, honor, and you're going to be able to walk by, and you're going to see your escrow blessings locked up in this memorial tomb, and you're going to know that you missed out on this wonderful and unique opportunity. Now, if that's what you want, then you go right ahead and you neglect Bible doctrine. Neglect this unique spiritual life. But if you want to live out the days of your life with blessings that are beyond dreams, I'm here to tell you that this spiritual life has blessings for you that is beyond dreams. And we're not talking about blessings in a material sense. We're talking about something greater. We're talking about spiritual blessings. We're talking about plus H, sharing the happiness of God. You know when you have that, you are a happy person. You are a stable person. You are not the double-minded person that James is talking about. And when you have that, you are living a life beyond dreams. And if you want to receive your crown of life, and if you want to receive your, your crown of righteousness, if you want to receive your escrow blessings for both time and eternity, then it is as simple as your own positive volition. It is as simple as taking in the Word of God day by day under your right pastor who teaches the Word of God accurately. So if you want to live this life beyond dreams, you can have it. So then, now let's shift gears and turn in your Bibles to Exodus 14, 16, 14, 16. And I'll read it. God is speaking here to Moses. And as for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. Verse 17. And as for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and horsemen. So before we close today, let's, make, let's take some points down. Point one, God allows the wrath of man because even the wrath of man shall praise God. During World War II, there was a huge influx of evil. We had evil leaders and Evil empires springing up everywhere. We had the anti-Semite Hitler. We had Stalin. We had Mussolini. We had Roosevelt. And we had uh, this evil Japanese empire that moved into Manchuria, slaughtered Chinese by the thousand, used biological weapons on them, and, and they would cut them up and do medical experiments just like um, Hitler did with uh, some of the Jews. And we had this horrendous wrath of man going on throughout the world. But that became a ripe time for evangelism. That became a time when many people decided that they needed to look for hope in other places instead of in the wrath of man. So a lot of them turned and had a faith in Jesus Christ. Now, point two. 
God knew that Pharaoh and the Egyptian chariot army would be negative to the gospel, so he allowed their negative volition to persist in order that others might see the power of God and have faith in Jesus Christ. So we all know what happened. God split the Red Sea and the children of Israel went across, and as the chariot army uh, came in behind them, the waters came over the top of them, drowning them, and they all died, and their bodies were washing up on the seashore. Now this became a memorial to a hard heart when people saw the rejection of Jesus Christ and Pharaoh over and over again through all of these miracles. The more that God was able to show the power that he had, then people all around the world, you know, somebody might say, hey man, did you hear what happened to the, the chariot army out there? And you say, no, what happened? I say, well, it, the sea just split, and and they ran in, they went into it, and it just collapsed over them, and the whole army was destroyed. So they say, well, how did that happen? And then they might hear the gospel and believe in Jesus Christ. So that's how the wrath of man praises God. Point three, God did not literally harden the hearts of the Egyptian chariot army. He merely allowed them to reject the gospel message for an extended period of time, which caused their hearts to be hardened. Point four, God does not arbitrarily harden anyone's heart. A person's heart becomes hardened only because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. And under point four, we have sub-point A. The unbeliever's heart becomes hardened because they reject Jesus Christ as Savior throughout their lifetime. And point B, the believer's heart becomes hardened because they reject Bible doctrine throughout their lifetime. So a believer can also have a hard heart. The children of Israel later will be called a people with a hard heart. So you can be a believer and get a hard heart by rejecting Bible doctrine. But the point we need to take down is that God doesn't arbitrarily harden anyone's heart. If you want a hard heart, that's a choice that you make. And when the Bible says that and God hardened their heart. It's just simply saying that God allowed them to live on this earth. It was his permissive will. He allowed them to have negative volition, and their hearts became hard. Now, God could have took Pharaoh out a long time ago, but he didn't because he used the Pharaoh's wrath to praise him. All right, tomorrow night we'll have to dig into some more points. We didn't get to the doctrine of grace. We might be able to get to that tomorrow, but we're going to have to take a look at Exodus uh, 14, 15, and discuss that. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you that we have learned today a source of blessing and challenge. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.